Since its creation in 1996, the USAID's Cuba program has been a hotbed for misallocation of funds that are supposed to create democracy and civil society in Cuba. However, billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars are getting stuck in the hands of USAID contractors and never reaching its final destination, Cuban society. During the Cuban Raptor crisis, a Cuban exile group based in Miami started flying into international airspace above the Florida Straits to assist Cuban Raptors making the dangerous attempt to migrate to the United States. However, as time progressed, the planes started to get closer and closer to Cuba's international airspace. The Cuban government accused the planes of dropping propaganda over the city of Havana. Le decíamos a Cuba, al pueblo cubano, a las fuerzas armadas que pueden hacer posible la libertad de Cuba, que hagan todo lo posible por llevar a término final el régimen de Cuba. February 24, 1996. The Cuban government warned the United States they would not tolerate these planes flying in their airspace. On February 24, 1996, Raul Castro gave the orders to shoot down the plane killing four young men. One month later, the Helms-Burton law was passed. What is the Helms-Burton Act? It is the basis of U.S. policy towards Cuba. It further codifies the travel ban as well as the embargo and promotes democracy programs on the island that aim towards regime change. oversees these programs. The USAID depends on private companies to carry out its projects. This reliance includes the contractor's ideas, judgments, and decisions on subcontracting project details in country. While those judgments and decisions are usually subject to oversight and final approval by USAID, it is typically the contractor's responsibility to initiate, manage, and execute them accordingly. One recipient of U.S. funds embezzled more than half a million dollars and used it to buy a $10,000 piano, $5,000 in artwork, and $16,000 in travel and lodging. Lawmakers want to have some influence over who gets the money, and they sometimes try to steer USAID contracts to their political allies. In March 2008, CANAF conducted a study of USAID programs. 
It showed that less than 17% of all USAID Cuba funds were used for direct on-island assistance. Some 56% went to universities and other institutions to study post-Castro scenarios and other issues. Much of the money was used to pay for operating expenses, office costs, and salaries. concerned over the administration's attempts to uh, cut much-needed democracy programs to the Cuban people. Forty pro-democracy activists remain on hunger strikes in Cuba to call attention to the dozens of Cubans who are being detained by Castro state security forces. These brave heroes are risking their lives, yet we are cutting their support, uh, which is not prudent, especially at a time when the crackdown a by Castro's thugs is actually on the rise on the island. went to Cuba in 2009 working for a U.S. government-funded international development group. Gross's family says his mission was to link Cuba's small Jewish community to the Internet. The Cuban government thought otherwise, charging Gross with smuggling in illegal equipment and with being a threat to the security and independence of the state. Last year, after he spent months and months behind bars, a Cuban court finally convicted Gross sentencing him to 15 years. I respect the sovereignty of Cuba. I have learned from my parents and through experience that respect is something that one must have in order to receive. That's Gross's wife, Judy, reading a statement her husband wrote by hand and delivered to a Havana court after his trial. She spoke to CNN's Jill Doherty last fall, shortly after a Cuban court turned down Gross's last appeal. Gross's case today. He is still currently serving his sentence in Havana and there are no current signs that he will be released anytime soon. His wife Judy Gross has filed a lawsuit against DAI for up to $60 million for not properly training her husband and sending him on a dangerous mission. The Cuban government has offered multiple times to discuss the issue of Alan Gross in addition to discussion in the situation of the Cuban Five. However, Washington has yet to budge on the issue. The situation that Alan Gross and his family find themselves is a frustrating one and a direct result of the broken relationship between Cuba and the United States. Alan broke Cuban law and it is unfortunate that he has been incarcerated. 
but both governments should be pursuing a path towards dialogue to try to develop a humanitarian response. Section 109 of the Helms-Burton Act, which established these covert and ill-managed USAID programs, are just another piece of the giant Cuba policy puzzle. These projects are not helping the Cuban people achieve democracy, are putting U.S. taxpayer dollars to waste, have put a U.S. citizen in jail, and are hindering U.S.-Cuba relations from making progress. <laughs>